Hello, my, my name is Seth Snyder. I am the section leader of process technology research and a big part of our work is on water and I'm at Oregon National Laboratory which is right down the road and my job here is to not give a presentation but to be a moderator and spark a discussion. We're going to be different from the last talk. We're not going to have um, we're not going to worry about timing speeches because we're not going to have any speeches. We're going to do this as a discussion. We've got a very distinguished panel. I'll introduce them, let them say a word or two, and then we'll move from there. And the, first of all, why am I here in terms of this? Most of work at Oregon National Laboratory has to do with energy. And there's a whole big question that some of, some of us will speak about with energy and water. And um, when we speak about energy, we speak about water at the same time. And I'm on a panel right now really trying to get that vision together, that to, to produce enough energy, we need enough water. To produce enough water, we need enough energy. And the first thing, we have a lot of, of disconnects in terms of what needs to be done. But in the national panel I'm working on now, there's one uniformity in decision, is that we don't have enough data. We, the actual, there's a lot of data out there and a lot of information out there, but it's very, very disjointed, it's very disconnected, and we can't make this good decisions because we don't have an aggregate of that data. So I, I try to put together a panel here, and I'm, I thank my, my, you know, the panelists that know, that know the water business, that know the water field, that, that can help us open the question so that we can drive that, that equation. So I will start off by introducing we have Karen Weigert, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of the City. Do you want to give a 30-second introduction why you're here and, and why water is important to you? Well, 30-second introduction, first of all, thank you. I'm here because I was invited. Uh, no, really here because the panel and the topic of water is one of the critical things when we think about the City of Chicago and our long-term livability, competitiveness, and sustainability. So the mayor has a broad vision for the city, and uh, there are really seven themes on the sustainability side, and water and wastewater is one of them. So you can see that from infrastructure policy and programs, and you can also see it in things like inviting people like Jimmy Fallon to experience the lake. <laughs> yeah. um, um, our second speaker is David St. Pierre, who's the executive director of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, which is the, the largest wastewater treatment facility in the world right down the road from here. David? Uh, thank you, uh, Dave St. Pierre, uh, I'm here Water's life. I've been in the water business for about 30 years. I've had the uh, fortunate pleasure of being in four major cities, uh, including Seattle, St. Louis, Atlanta, and now Chicago. And the issues surrounding water, uh, as you move from place to place, might be a little bit different, but the majority of the issues are all the same. So good to be here. Um, next we have, um, also from the Reclamation District, but a commissioner, and, and although we don't think of ourselves as in a political setting here, I did vote for her more than one time. <laughs> and, and, and originally, and I was interested in her work when she originally ran to be a commissioner of the Reclamation District and, and, the, and the progressive vision she proposed there. So Deborah Shaw. Thank you, Seth, and good afternoon, everyone. And Seth's exactly right. I'm an elected official, not a subject matter expert, but ran for the board of the Water Reclamation District eight years ago for the first time because I believe water is going to be the issue in years to come and I still find that to be true and felt that I had something to bring to this and the elected board makes policy decisions about <coughs> stormwater management and wastewater service for the equivalent of 10 million people in the second largest county in the country. And next we have Sharon Feng, who's the executive director of the Institute of Molecular Engineering, which is a new engineering um, institute at the University of Chicago. And I work very closely with Sharon, and, and we had mention of the project with Ben Gurion at the lead, um, previous talk. And Sharon is a real lead coordinator of that. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I think the reason, says ask us what the reason we're here. The reason is really water for the last maybe six to eight months since our uh, mayor and uh, university president signed this agreement with uh, President Shimon Peres is something that I not only drink, but eat, talk, sleep on, dream about, 
every day. So of course I'm going to be at anything that talk about water. So that's the reason. Um, really, I would. I'm very excited to be here to really have a time to share with everybody what kind of initiatives that's going on right now at the University of Chicago in partnership with Argo National Lab with Bangorin University, trying to really make some difference in this space that is really impactful and relevant to everybody's life. And finally, we have the, the person who actually worked the hardest to get here. Marianne Dickinson is the CEO and the president of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a nonprofit. And she actually gave a talk in, in South Carolina, and her flights were canceled because of the weather on the East Coast. And she really worked hard to get here. And so she, it's been a very long morning for her so yeah. far. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I didn't want to miss this, this session. This is a great panel. Sustainable water. I'm like Sharon. You know, I live, breathe, and think sustainable water. Um, I represent the Alliance for Water Efficiency, which is a North American nonprofit whose mission statement says we're dedicated to the efficient and sustainable use of water. And we are actually international. We have extended beyond U.S. and Canada, where we originally uh, formed, to look at the issues surrounding sustainable water use. And they do include the connection between water and energy. We spend a lot of time with the drinking water utility industry, and that has its challenges, and we'll talk about some of that, because I think the perceptions that uh, the drinking water industry as a nation uh, live with are sometimes barriers to thinking more creatively about how to use water sustainably in the future. OK, so I had some discussion points. And this is going to be an open discussion. And then we'll leave time, and we'll have discussion with the audience, too. So first of all, since you actually did stay up the night for this, um, what keeps you up at night in terms of water? <laughs> <laughs> OK, what keeps me up at night? Um, there, there are kind of four things. And I, I thought about this in the question that he asked. Um, and, and yes, we want to make sure that sustainability is something that we think about you know, on a regular operational basis. But as we want to grow, as we want our economies to grow, as we want uh, all of our businesses to thrive and our communities to thrive, we have to make sure that we are not increasing the footprint of our water and energy use to the extent that that's not sustainable. So that's kind of the envelope of the crisis. Um, but in that envelope is making sure we, we maintain the safety, the quality of the water supplies and the quality of the treatment, engaging the customer and understanding what that means. And that's turned out to be a massive management challenge, getting the customer to understand what goes into delivering the safest, most affordable drinking water in the world to their doorstep. And that's a consuming passion of ours, uh, trying to get the consumer to think about reducing their water waste or to, to think about helping their community to grow productively. Um, and then the last crisis that I think about at night is, and then how do we pay for it all? Um, the big water efficiency conundrum is, as you use less water, you sell less water. And you sell less water, you can't meet your fixed costs. And it all becomes this vicious cycle that we have to break. So it's those things that basically keep me up at night. Uh, in support of that, some of the work that, that I'm doing, I was having a discussion with some students at Northwestern this morning, is that there's a fundamental in an urban system of, of, of thought that water should be free. Right. And it should be less than free on the water treatment side. And so we have an expectation of a high quality water because as, as human beings, we have that deserve that right. And, and so at, w there's a strong belief that water should be free, but that we know to meet sustainability requirements, it, it can't be free. There is a cost for delivering a sustainable water system. And on the back end, um, treating water, nobody ever wants to pay for. And so we have actually a, an expert who is getting close to seven figures in terms of the number of people serves. How do, we, how do we deal with a question, that, and what keeps you up at night, that, that you're basically for millions of people dealing with a wastewater treatment, and nobody wants to pay for it? Well, actually, in Chicago, we have a pretty good funding mechanism for water, uh, and are one of the fortunate utilities that we actually uh, can't afford a, a very good capital program. Uh, but the issue of value of water is, is a significant issue uh, throughout the country and in this area as well. And it's not just water. It doesn't stop there. You know, the environment, uh, we have this idea that the environment should be free. The air we breathe, the water we drink, uh, the uh, multiple, multiple benefits that we receive from the environment, that basically they should be free. And um, I think that Maybe in the 1800s, when there was a billion people on the planet, 
uh, that might have been a paradigm that could work. Uh, we are uh, over 7 billion people on this uh, small planet now, and we just have to change our thinking. The environment's not free. It's something that we need to preserve and we need to invest in. And along those lines, Deborah, I see you, all, you speak into the community all the time. What are the questions people ask you, and how do you, how do you talk about the service that, that is provided? So I get questions about um, flooding, basement backups. What keeps me up at night is rain. Uh, I feel like I have a whole different relationship with rain since I took office <laughs> because I worry about it. Because too much rain all at once in too small an area uh, overwhelms the capacity of local sewer systems to manage it. And uh, broadly speaking, we don't understand how our water or wastewater infrastructure works. It's out of sight, it's out of mind. Um, and so there are these common urban myths that there's a magic valve or a secret key that someone can turn and release water to the lake and all of a sudden uh, basement's empty. Uh, I'm here to tell you there's no magic valve or secret key. Are you suggesting that there's gravity? I'm not going <laughs> that far. <laughs> that it sinks the water? Karen, along those lines, I, I know I see you speak in public all the time. Um, what, what, is the, what is the interface between the city and the residents in terms of dealing with water? Yeah, I think we hear a lot of the questions that Deborah was mentioning. You know, if you're a resident, you experience water in very different ways. You, you experience the expectation of reliability, that water will arrive and water will leave, and you experience the unexpected water that is suddenly in your basement and on your street. And so I think there's a very acute pain point around flooding in Chicago. And certainly then there's this great expectation of ongoing, reliable, wonderful performance. And we have you know, extraordinarily good drinking water, and it is uh, quite honestly very inexpensive when you think about a resource that's available. So those are sort of the very personal day-to-day -day interactions, but we also have to think about it in a broader context here in Chicago, where our residents have grown up next to one of the most amazing natural resources in the world, which is Lake Michigan. And so we have an opportunity to really think about that as framing our conversation and framing both conservation and then treatment, because it does come right there from the lake, and you can actually go and see it and experience it. So some of the ways where we also think about that, that resident experience is expanding their relationship with water. So we have 26 miles of free public lakefront, 24 free beaches, but we're also expanding opportunities to engage with the river. So adding boat houses, building the river walk downtown, really making that piece of nature that, you know, that David was talking about part of your experience, part of the ongoing historic value proposition of Chicago, which then can lead you know, very clearly into a more nuanced understanding of the water that comes into your home, leaves your home, and sometimes unexpectedly is in your basement. Sharon. Along these lines, you're part of this whole creation of, of the Institute with the University of Chicago and Ben Gurion University for advancing water technologies. Um, what do, where do you see that going? Yeah, so it seems like everybody's up all night, uh, actually. <laughs> what really keep me up uh, is really realizing how the enormity uh, of the challenge as well as the opportunities that really is something nobody, no institution, no one city or even one country could really develop a solution to meet this challenge alone. So it brings on the really the necessity of the partnership. So partially, uh, University of Chicago, uh, always in partnership with AGA, realized uh, this is a bigger problem uh, that really brings, needs all the hands on deck, so to speak, to solve. Uh, so we started searching for partners in, in this space. What's really interesting is you think of it, at University of Chicago, who resides on the Lake of Michigan, which is 20% of the world's fresh water source, and get together with Bengali University, which is in the middle of the desert of Negev, <laughs> which has no water whatsoever. Uh, it is really that two extremes of needs actually coming together with the brain power and the will power wanted to do something about the water, even though we're attacking the problem from two very different opposite end. I think it really generates a lot of uh, electricity and uh, uh, momentum in this partnership. But also, I think what also motivated in uh, last year, we have uh, a group of 15 
um, Seth was part of it, uh, myself, 15 scientists from University of Chicago and Argon go all the way to Israel to meet our Israel comparts and have a wor workshop in this area. What motivates us is this one quote, actually, to myself. It is a quote actually said by a venture capitalist in, uh, in San Francisco, talked about this uh, water problem not only being the million dollar opportunity, which is, you know, depend on how you put the values on these things. But also, it is a space where he terms as the biggest mismatch of a screaming enormous market of need and the lack of innovation. So basically, um, he's talking about today, we're still uh, using some of the 19th century filtration technologies, trying to get rid of all the emerging contaminants that generated in 21st century. So there is certainly a technology a mismatch and a gap there that needs to be closed in. And uh, the innovators out there actually by counts of millions uh, wanted to bring these new technology into this marketplace, but why it's so difficult. So I think that's some of the questions, maybe some of the regulators, some of the policy makers, uh, our, our end users of a city uh, can really bring to the light to say what takes for moving these uh, scientific discoveries, inventions that could make difference in bring more cleaner, cheaper water, accessible water to the society. So that's actually a, more than a scientific challenge, I think, to us. Marianne, um, where, where do we need, I think you're the most confident in terms of technology, where technology is moving forward. Where, where should we be investing in technology for water management, water technology, and what are the gaps in, in data that we still have to think about? Okay, before I answer your question, I'd like I, to actually uh, comment on something Sharon just said, because what she said it leads into the answer to your question. And that is that you can have all kinds of innovation, technological innovation, but if you don't have uptake by the clients, if you don't have a market that's created that actually is funding the use of that innovation, uh, you create what's called in the inventor's world the valley of death, where the inventor provides the, the new technology and, and the, the invention and can't sell it. And by the time he sells it, he's out of business, unless he makes it through the valley of death and then finally there's a tipping point and there's uptake. And the problem is that the, the water utility industry, and I'll speak for the drinking water side, because um, we, we work with them all across the country, they're fundamentally a very conservative group. Um, it's about me second, not me first. Let someone else pilot it. Let me see someone else do this first, and then I'll consider investing. Because I've got ratepayer money, and you know I want to invest my ratepayer money wisely, so I don't want to take a risk that might not turn out well. So they're very risk averse. And you can't be risk averse and test new technology. So in the field of water efficiency, there's lots of wonderful opportunity for technologies, but they will cost money. And that change out over a period of time will yield a return on investment, but it still requires an upfront investment. And the drinking water industry is struggling with the declining demand across the country. Demand is going down for a whole series of very good and desirable reasons. But it does mean that because we're not revamping our rate structures to deal with the reduced sales in many parts of the country, then there's reduced money for investment, for infrastructure maintenance, for all kinds of things. So we, we, we kind of stick with this old paradigm of the gray infrastructure rather than moving into the green infrastructure and spending the money that's needed to make that leapfrog change. So to give you an example of technology, in energy you've got two-way smart meters. Two-way, when I say two-way, I mean that the customer's data is read by the energy utility, but the energy utility has the opportunity to manage the customer's use at that point. So the customer can sign up for a reduced rate if their air conditioning can be shut off during a, a particularly critical peak period. There's no such thing like that in water. Smart meters in water are one-way only, and they are not management tools. And furthermore, in water, there's no time of day billing. All of these are not radical new concepts, but it takes such a long time in the water industry for change to happen that smart meters, would, you would think, would be really prevalent being installed everywhere. It's taking a long time. So all of the, the sensor technology that could help improve water quality, all of the efficiency technology, you know, in terms of point of uh, end use consumption, all of that would require investment on the part of the drinking water utility who now claims they don't have the, the capital funds to make those kinds yeah. of investments. So what does the inventor do? Actually, that is a big gap. Uh, there's a number of folks from Oregon here. That's a gap we all experience who work on technology. I'm going to push that to two people, to Karen and to Deborah. 
I mean, what we always say we need when, we, when we're looking at a, a deployment of new technology, we need first adopters. People who are willing, because they, they know, they know their, their customers are willing to take that risk. And, and, and I know, in, in every, all that I've read about you, I think of you as a progressive who's willing to take risks to try things to improve the environment. And, and Cameron, I don't know, have, have, is what, is, is the city, is the reclamation district the, the place to do, be a first adopter of new technology? I think they're both great places to think about this. And I think you know, some of the context is really interesting, because it's interesting because as some of the talking happening, there was a slide about increases in global water demand. But if you look in the city of Chicago, per capita water demand is down by something like 40% since 1990. So you're seeing very different things around the globe. And that's you know, in increases in efficiency in, in yes. shower heads and toilets and everything. So you're seeing a very different structure. Now, in terms of innovation, technology is one piece, business model is another. And simply thinking about rate structure layers into that. So the city of Chicago actually raised water rates. So we know we have to have a very significant capital plan to ensure that our aging infrastructure is able to meet the demand that is here. So we're replacing 900 miles of water mains to deliver this great drinking water to home. So we think we did 75 miles last year. That's more than double what any other city is doing. So simply thinking about how can we create the economics to allow for the infrastructure that we need is a core foundation of this. We then have to think about how do you layer on top of that the kinds of technologies that will give us the information and innovation to build upon. But if you're building it on an infrastructure that's 100 years old and leaking, you've got a very different challenge. So we are building up and shoring up that infrastructure that we can layer on top of that some of the innovations that are to come. I've been thinking, Seth, about some of the questions you posed in the intersection of data and behavior. One of the issues we're seeing in stormwater uh, as I mentioned earlier, local sewer systems, which are owned and maintained by each municipality, have a limited capacity. And when, certainly in the combined sewer areas, when the pipes fill up, they'll either back up into our basements or overflow directly into a river or stream. We know that if we can t ask or tell people that a big rainstorm is coming, not to use their washing machine, not to use their dishwasher, perhaps delay taking a shower, will reduce the amount of load on that municipal sewer system and perhaps give it additional capacity to manage a rainstorm. So through real-time weather and texting, can we get messages to the right people to change behavior, or at least to give them information. We, we certainly do that on the power structure. We're, you know, where I work at Oregon, you know, we, we say it's a very hot day. They say shut off computer monitors. You know, we, we, we have that message on the power side to avoid brownouts. I've never heard anybody mention that before in the water. That's, that's a really nice idea. David, how, how might you implement that? How might you implement a real-time demand? A real-time demand and, and, a, and a push out of a socialization. Or a push on technology. A push on I technology and a push on, on social. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the technology issue a little bit mm -hmm. because um, it is a very conservative group and market drives a lot of things. Uh, Karen mentioned the reinvestment in infrastructure just to get back to ground zero, right? And that's huge across the country. So. Um, Utilities as they were created, whether they're drinking water utilities or wastewater utilities, are separate entities. There's, I believe, what's the number, 40,000? 53,000. 53,000 drinking water systems, yeah. Separate systems. Yeah. Now those are run by, you know, uh, little towns and throughout Illinois that really don't have any capital to invest in technology, don't have uh, any impetus to really invest in that type of system. Uh, something very different is going on in Europe right now. Uh, Europe has exhausted natural resources, and Europe is developing the technologies predominantly that are new in this industry uh, because to produce energy, to produce uh, water, to reuse water, all of that has become a very critical tipping point in uh, European countries. If we don't figure this out, then we're going to miss in my mind, what is the future industry, which is the environment industry. Uh, this planet is gonna have to figure out how to support itself going forward. Those technologies are being developed. So I, I do believe that this sector, the utility sector, has to be willing to take risks. 
Uh, Chicago is venturing out on several uh, very unique processes. Uh, we, we are trying to work to, uh, with American Water to reuse some water in industrial corridors to start that process of mm -hmm. uh, polishing some water for a very concentrated uh, group of industrial users. Uh, we are uh, in Springfield right now to have the ability to resell natural uh, resources that we can recover from water, one of those being phosphorus, uh, so that we can extract the phosphorus from the water. We're looking at a process in our Stickney plant that will be able to recover 10,000 tons a year and uh, be able to return that to the uh, uh, fertilizer industry. Uh, we're looking for... Uh, David, as, as, for a, as a small point, nitrogen as a fertilizer we can actually produce from natural gas from, from nitrogen from the atmosphere via ammonia. Phosphorus is a material we have to mine and it's an unsustainable resource. So, the, That's correct. I mean, there are several articles out there that the next crisis or another crisis uh, upon us is the depletion of phosphorus. We need phosphorus to feed people. If we're going to feed people we need to figure out how to extract that and reuse phosphorus from uh, those sources and wastewater is a great resource uh, recovery potential for phosphorus and energy uh, you all had a nice lunch I, I hope I trust uh, I'm guessing that maybe there was food left on your plate uh, that food has calorie content uh, we're looking to uh, utilize uh, the current footprint of digesters that we have to take advantage of that and to recover food energy potential and as the district, we have the potential in our existing footprint to recover 80 megawatts of power uh, that we're currently operating at about 13 megawatts is all we recover. So we're looking at these technologies. technologies. Uh, one of the most exciting is a process that removes ammonia and breaks down ammonia without air demand uh, and could reduce the electrical use in a wastewater footprint by 40%. Now that would be huge across the grid, uh, reducing that kind of energy consumption. But it's going to take leadership in this, um, in the utility sector to move forward on these fronts and recognize that we do have that responsibility and that this is the cutting edge market and will be the market of, of the future. Okay. I'm going to open this up a little bit. Does anybody on the panel want to ask anybody else on the panel a question? Really free form it. Well, I'd actually just like to make a comment after okay. Dave, if I could. Um, I am very, very proud to be here in the city of Chicago because Chicago shows enormous leadership in these issues. But it's not true all across the United States it's, or, or North America in general. And the leadership that, that Chicago shows in drinking water, wastewater, and sustainability efforts is replicated by a handful of cities across the country in that same vein. So how do we get that to domino? How do we get that to be the norm rather than the exception? So I guess that is a question to yeah. the panel. How, how do we do that? Well, I think we have to produce a business model that makes sense. I think we have to produce a structure that becomes cost effective to recover phosphorus and that there's a market for it and that we help smaller utilities uh, delve into that market and actually uh, have a return on investment for their constituents. Uh, water reuse the same way. There's uh, all these reuse industries have actually laws that prohibit uh, some of that recovery process. So I think from a legislative standpoint, we need to look at the laws that are uh, really holding back the industry from being able to recover resources and reuse those. Uh, some of those laws would have come for basically for safety concerns, and we, we maybe have moved well beyond that. Yeah, we need to think, rethink that. You know, things that I guess we've looked at as waste in the past, we need to start looking as, at the it's potential resource. of resource mm -hmm. and get back to thinking that, you know, there's probably a practical use for every part of that buffalo. And, and figure that out and, and figure out then how to sustain life through a much more reasonable approach. Some of the other things that fit into this exact vein are, we have examples that have worked documenting and sharing those. Some of them are going to be large, whole-scale business model changes. Some of them are pilots that we've all done. Some of them are policies that we've tried or programs that we've implemented. And a lot of the way that I see sustainability, energy issues, water issues, 
being transitioned are networks of folks in roles like ours where we actually have an opportunity to share those ideas, but to have them in a clear, documented way so that you can actually go back and say, you know, we look like this other location. Let's go try it. Here are the results that someone else has had. Mm -hmm. So there's very much an opportunity to codify what's happening here and simply make it easy. All of us are dealing with all kinds of barriers in multiple sectors, but success is a great thing, and scaling is a great thing. So if it's worked somewhere else, there's a good chance to make it work where you are. I, I think that's a good point, and, and that gets back to we're very disjointed with water and data. And the other thing which we're supposed to be leading into this, this is for the World Urban Forum, is Chicago is a leader, and, and what we learn here in Chicago can be applied to areas where, where, where we're with much higher poverty. You know, that can't be a first adopter. Does anybody have any thoughts on that, how we might take what we learn, what we know, and, and implement in Chicago, and push it out to, to cities that don't have the ability to try like we do? The big barrier is funding. Um, the cities that are not able to fund, they perceive green infrastructure costs more money than gray infrastructure. So they don't go down that path because they think it's more expensive and requires more investment. They don't look at the long-term benefits that actually makes it cheaper from an operational, uh, you know, life cycle investment point of view. But a lot of our communities are really struggling financially, and, and that's, that's part of the results of the 2008 recession still being felt, but it, it, it is a significant barrier because you still have to have the funding to invest. I mean, Chicago, yes, raised its rates, but there are a lot of communities that are where the local officials, the elected officials, are saying no to rate increases. So if you're under collecting your costs to start with, how are you going to get out of that hole to invest in something that is better for the future? And so that's fundamentally a barrier. Yeah, and, and, and that's piece. kind of psychological that water is a right and so should be very, well, right. very low cost. Every time it rains, people think the water bill should go down because, you know, if you're in a drought yes. like in California, when it rained, people said, oh, the drought's over. Well. It isn't really. <laughs> it didn't yes. rain in the catchment areas. It rained in the coast. But, but people perceive that it's over. My water bill should go down because now you've got water. So the cost of delivery, the cost of treatment, the cost of getting it to them, none of that is perceived by the customer to be uh, an important cost. Does, do you share information with less affluent communities in, in terms of best practices? Uh, we absolutely yeah. do. There's quite a network in the industry. There's several. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an abundance of agencies that uh, you belong to as uh, utility agencies. and Is that just U.S. or is that international? Uh, it's state, it's at the state level, it's at the local level, it's at the uh, international level. Yeah, it is. It, it, it really is a very good uh, forum to share ideas. It doesn't overcome uh, the issue of this product desert and not having finances to um, support the use of those products. So I'm just going to throw out a wild thought here. Why not? You know, that's what we're here for, right? Uh, but it seems to me if the environment has a value, we need to rethink how we do this. Um, utilities have a very marked mission. It would be very difficult for uh, the city of Chicago to be investing in uh, some kind of technology that does some wild thing when they have 75 miles of pipe a year that they need to uh, address within a, a water delivery system. Um, and, there's, and there's other issues that we're facing. So we've got nutrient runoff issues in the state. We've got a, a very large farm uh, industry in the state and uh, we need food and they need to produce food, but we also need to, to reduce nutrient runoff. We need nutrient controls in some point source plants. Uh, we have micro constituents that are gonna follow that, but we really don't have, you know, since we have, how many did you say, 52,000? Mm -hmm. 40,000 is the number I'm used to hearing, but we have all these disconnected agencies taking care of or trying to take care of the environment in a 1972 paradigm. How do we change the paradigm? How do we change that thought? the environment has a value, why don't we have a utility responsible for that environment? If you're going to pay $100 for cable in your home, why wouldn't you pay $100 a month for the environment? We need industry in this country. The future industry in this country needs to be environmental. And if we're not going to put the money into that market that can drive the technology and the innovation, we can create a market, I believe, around the environment. Now there's a wild thought for you. Oh, I, I, I strongly support that. 
Um, if you think about it in terms of, of cities, population is not limited by the amount of land because we've learned to go vertical, but it's limited by, by water availability. But in support of that, I, I tend to stick out my neck. I'm, so I'm on this panel for Department of Energy, and I said, what they said is, is my goal, and I said is to rename it the Department of Energy and Water. Yes. And I almost had my head chopped off. Oh. <laughs> so. See, and I think it's a great idea. I and love so, it. <laughs> You, you speak to Ron and others about that. We, we have a, a mutual <laughs> colleague. That, that it's something that, that we have to think about. It. It's, it's, a, it's a commodity that basically defines how productive we can be as, as human beings. And, and so that's, that's really wh why I am here. But I think you're very right, and there's a value on the environment, and I think that's why you know, you've been successful in your role. Um, one of the challenges here is that we're at the home of Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago. Who, who basically puts that all as an externality. And it's basically what you're saying, we have to pay for our own externalities. And, and that's a difference in, in, in a drinking water where people have a high expectation. So if you look at societies, um, the first thing people will demand is a high quality drinking water as society develops. But it's the last thing they think about is, is the cost and, and managing the waste efficiently. As society advances, and you know, we'll see that we want a better quality environment. But that comes secondary in the infrastructure on one end you know, legs the other, and so it's, it is a challenge, and I don't, I don't have the answer yet. You know, I think eventually it's Department of Energy and Water, but I don't know that it will necessarily happen, you know, in, 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 I suggested it happen in five years, but I don't think it will happen then. Uh, maybe this is a good point to come, come back to the theme of this uh, afternoon's panel as being informed the city. The data uh, also best practice is part of the data can really help push the needles in my opinion and I come back to the partnerships with uh, Ben Gurion and uh, you know of all the partners we can pick around the globe why do we pick Ben Gurion Israel actually figured out how to really solve this problem I was very surprised to find out when I was there in Tel Aviv in October that they use 80 percent of their black water mm -hmm. for agricultural irrigation and anybody can guess what the U.S. ratio rate is? Less than five. Well, actually, it's a little encouraging. It's like you know, less than five. I think that's what I was given. They don't want to go how much lower. So they did it because, of course, the necessity. They just don't have abundance of water. But they certainly had a technology that can do it. They had economics. You know, they now go broke just by going doing that. So how do we borrow those best practices and how do we share those best practices? I think that's what this data-driven uh, theme would really help is how to use technology to really propagate these already best practices so other people can benefit from their experience. I mean, they get their drinking water uh, right now 60% from desalination, but in three or four years, it will be 100% from desalination. So I think they have all these technologies already well developed and deployed. So they probably already passed that value of death. So yeah, the question well, is how do you adopt them? Well, I, yeah. it's leadership because I, I was at a conference. That they have a WATEC is their big right, conference right. every October. And Shimon Perez gave a closing speech at the one that I right. attended. And he said, we want to be in Israel the Silicon Valley of water efficiency technology. And they made the national investment to make that happen, and they, they gave the investment. Whereas here in the United States, how much money did we put from the stimulus bill into water? Next to nothing. I mean, we have, what, $787 billion that was in the stimulus package, and a total of 12 went to water and wastewater programs. Um, that's a very small percentage compared to what's really needed. Um, and that's not even the new technology. That's even just repairing existing yeah. infrastructure. That was infrastructure. I don't think there was any in, in, in water R&D. No, no, no water R&D. Zero. And that's just, and that's, that's the leadership we have to change. We, we, have to, we, have to, we have to do what Jerome Perez did. Yeah. I'm gonna, so we have, we have um, microphones somewhere in the back if, if we want questions from the audience. The problem with water redevelopment is that there's a, the business model you know, doesn't show <clears throat> an immediate return. But I, su I suspect big data, when it was first uh, begun, uh, didn't have a, 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 a terrific return either, other than a, a visionary. Is there an opportunity on the water side to think about it as a, a vision for economic development? Anybody wants? I certainly think that. Uh, I mean, one of the very attractive uh, 
features of Chicago is the water. You know, so certainly it is something that Chicago to attract industry uh, into this area. I, I can't believe how cheap water is in this region. Uh, Karen, I would support a triple increase even from mm -hmm. your increase uh, as far as the value of water. Um, and, and you'd still be below the average. The mayor could blame me, <laughs> in, in fact, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you would still be below the national average. Right. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous what we charge for water. So it is attractive. I think uh, the water uh, reuse paradigm can be attractive because because I believe that that can be delivered for even less and it's very high quality water. Uh, our effluent from our plants is probably better than 90% of the water drinking water intakes in this country uh, in terms of quality. So uh, there is a value there, there is a market there and I, I do think we have to look at ways that we can attract uh, industry uh, into the community on that basis and take advantage of, of water for that purpose. And, and I think we will see that with what's happening in California in the Southwest, that it's getting to a crisis where they may reach a point where we say no new development because they, they don't have access to the water. So one of the things that, that I've been looking at recently, there's a, a, a seawater desalination plant that's being built in San Diego that's supposed to come online, I think in 2016, I'm not exactly sure when, that will supply about 10% of their water demand. And it is, and what's really at risk is something like close to 90% of their water demand. They get 90% of their water imported via like the Sierra Nevada, the, the snowpack from the Sierra, and that is largely going away. So you're in a situation where you have a, a city that's maybe half the size of Chicago, I don't know exactly, and they have 90% of their water at risk, and they have a billion dollar solution that's gonna provide 10% of the water. And then if you actually look at the energy requirement for the desalination, it's gonna require an increase in, in, in basically in their power production. So I, I think you're definitely right that we definitely can see water as an opportunity for business development. And if we think about it smartly in terms of doing it at a sustainable level. But, but there's San Diego with its nuclear plant shut down. San Onofre now is offline. So they are not gonna have as much energy as they once thought they were gonna have when they ran the economics for the, the plant. Water and energy, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. And um, that's gonna be, I think, the biggest issue going forward in sustainable resource planning, is making sure you're optimizing both. There was a question yeah. in the back. Hi, I'm Lee Stahlbaumann from PepsiCo, and I live fairly locally. Um, I think an important thing to remember as you do best practice sharing and learnings is, is not to try to match up the situations too closely. One of the best, best examples I can think of is Singapore, which has not that much in common with Chicago. They're, you know, they do not have water. They don't. And they're also a very different culture than we are, but they have done an outstanding job of educating and publicizing water reuse. They made it cool. They didn't, they didn't dictate to people, you are gonna have re reused water. They made it cool. They have a mascot called Wally Water. People invite him to weddings. I am not making that up. That's true. So I think I think that it's always good to to take what to glean what you can, what lessons you can, without worrying that their situa a different situation is not quite the same as one's own situation. S since I know Lee, can can I ask you a question in, in reverse? I, I've heard Coca Cola discuss this. Do you place pants? Do you place your PepsiCo plants based on water availability? So interestingly, right now, this, this very first quarter of this year, I am going back and forth to India once a month to look at doing that. We've not historically done it everywhere, but we're getting smarter about it. And, and India is a very prime example of not enough water. So we're, we're learning how to do that better than we have. I think, I think before it hasn't been a policy. I think it's been done in certain cases. And I've not been with the company long enough at all to have a, a, an in-depth history. But I can say that we are absolutely looking at that when we look at, at, at growing, and India is one of our big growth markets. Other questions? Okay, why don't we then have some closing statements and then we'll finish up on time. Um, we, we went this way, so Marianne, a closing statement. Okay. Um, at first, I thought we were going to talk about what were some of the data issues that we might want to see in the future. So I'm actually going to close with that, okay. if that's okay. 
Um, wh what are, how can our decisions improve with better data in water? How can we be more sustainable in water? Um, you know, there's a concept emerging called precision conservation where, where everything is sensor driven and where you're, and I'm not just talking about efficiency, I'm talking about conservation of, of, of all kinds, where, where the data drives the application of the solution. And as we get into these micro environments um, where we can really productively use the accumulation of more data to better manage the environment we're in, I think we'll all do a whole lot better. Um, and this is an area where in water efficiency we're beginning to see that these micro uh, analyzers are going to be very important um, to, to making sure that, that we keep water quality constant as we're using less water and, and the water stays longer residence time in the drinking water lines and in the lines within the buildings. As we do a lot of green building, we're finding that the water is sitting in the pipes for, for long periods of time and Legionella is, is starting to emerge as probably a, a, the largest public health issue in the drinking water <coughs> industry. We've taken care of everything else and now Legionella is sort of surfacing as this new issue to worry about. But Precision monitoring and sensing and better data collection can help manage that on site in a way that we've never thought about doing that before. So we have new opportunities in, in data collection with technology. I think we should consider more crowdsourcing for water efficiency programs. And it's sort of like what Deborah was talking about in terms of altering consumer behavior during times of flooding. Um, there, there are apps that you can download from water utilities and drought written areas where you ask the, the, the community at large to document where water is being wasted. And then those pictures are uploaded to a website where an enforcement agent can come out and take a look. That's using your customer much more productively long term in the solution. But I think just better measurement of end use consumption in general. Um, Chicago is not the only city that isn't fully metered. There are, there are a number of them around the country. And, and better end use measurement and sub-metering is really pretty critical to, to managing that water use. And we've got really new, great uh, technological innovations in meters. It's not your father's brass meter of the 30s anymore. I mean, it's, it's a new world out there that we should be exploring. Um, and then I'm finally, I'm just, I'm a fan of the water you have is going to be the cheapest water you'll ever have because you already have it and you should reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. And in Australia, they spend a fair amount of, of their resources making sure that, that it isn't potable water that's put out on their urban landscapes. It's water that already has been used once in some gray water application. So we need to think more about that so we stretch our water supplies uh, further. Thank you. Sharon? Yeah, I'm just going to uh, illustrate one point of learning that uh, we have collectively uh, learned from the last uh, last some year of journey down in uh, innovation in this water research uh, space. Uh, as I mentioned before, we all realized that this is uh, such an enormous challenge and uh, nobody can do it alone, so we need the partnerships. But we also since to realize uh, speaking as a true scientist, that, that science is not the, the only solution to this problem. So we have since uh, started really reaching out to build a truly uh, multilateral, holistic uh, research innovation community that involves not only just science, also the policymakers, the behavior science, urban design. So uh, I wanted to do a little advertisements for Chicago really is University of Chicago, lucky for us, we found actually on our campus that, that there are almost every discipline well mentioned that there are people actually doing research in this area, working in this area in partner with city, with clean energy trust. So we have an ecosystem here actually kind of inherited right here to really make differences together. So it's now, it's a learning for scientists to say, you know, technology cannot accomplish this alone. We really needed to really work together with everybody else, and I hope this is also a message can be sort of broadcasted to everywhere else in the world is the same thing, that we can all work on this together. Thank you. Well, Sharon, I'm glad to hear you say that because I wanted to make a plea for humility. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend several weeks at the Kennedy School of Government a few years ago in a program for um, senior officials in state and local government, and there they made a big distinction between technical solutions and adaptive change, or what I would call changing the culture. And yes, we can find technical solutions, but 
I mean, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico was a technical solution to our uh, unquenchable thirst for oil. The adaptive change is to learn to live uh, using less oil. I personally am very concerned about the rush to desalination. It's a technical solution. We can turn salt water into fresh water, but I don't think we know enough yet about the long-term effects on the ecosystem of dispersing this highly toxic brine, the residue of the process, back into the ocean in a much more concentrated form than exists in nature. It's been said that all problems started out as solutions. <laughs> we reversed a river. And I mean, water is the ultimate solvent. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Water is the ultimate solvent. So that's your solution. Um, <laughs> we can engineer our way out of almost anything. The question is, should we? And so I, I make a plea for humility in scanning the landscape as we search for those solutions. Amen. David? Well, I think we live in an exciting time. <clears throat> I think we have a lot of opportunity. I think we live in a country that has the ability to uh, develop technology and solve really any problem. Uh, we are part of an industry in water that is not well funded, uh, that has some significant challenges, but has also on the other side of that some very exciting opportunities. Uh, I think this landscape is going to change significantly with the current uh, utility leadership in this, uh, in this present time significantly over the next five years. And uh, there's uh, just a lot of exciting things that's going to happen. Stay plugged in and stay tuned. <laughs> I get to do the close. How good is that? Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you all for really having this dialogue and being a part of it here in Chicago. It's a, it's a global challenge. There are tremendous local opportunities, and many local opportunities apply in multiple locations. So this is just an example of a lot of that. The, the fact that we've got people on this panel who are working nationally and internationally, that we've got partnerships that are spanning the globe as we think about water, those are the kinds of things we're going to need to really tackle and continue to innovate. But we're also going to need to do the real blocking and tackling of existing infrastructure in cities. And then we have to layer on that an ongoing engagement and awareness of what water is and what other natural resources really are. And as I think about that, some of the things that are changing for all of us haven't come up as much, and that is the climate is changing, which means weather data is changing, which means all the information that helps us predict how much water is going to land on our streets, how much we're going to have to process, how much isn't going to land in other parts of the country, depending on storm events and drought, that actually changes the data environment. And so as we all look to make good, rational, fact-based decisions, understanding what those facts are is really going to matter, and that's quite honestly a global story for all of us. But it'll come down to real leadership, real solutions, practical ideas that we can test, scale, and deliver so that we can continue to have really interesting conversations about solutions as we go forward. So thank you. Well, I, this was a wonderful panel. I went much further than I thought. I'm very, very proud to be part of it. Um, if, by the way, if we did this panel and we had people from just say, the energy industry which are interested in thermoelectric cooling, we would have had a completely dis different discussion. If we had this a, a panel of farmers talking about water, it would have sounded very, very different. And that's one of the challenges of water. It's the same commodity, but everybody thinks about it differently. And hopefully, when we think about it from a data standpoint, we can take it to a next level. That's not going to happen in 2014, but I think we need to start the process. And it may take a decade or more. But we were thinking about urban systems, so we got what we thought was the best in class for looking at it from an urban standpoint. Let's thank our panel, and I thank you for listening.